If you are wondering how two guys from Sweden are making nuclear cool again, stick around. Last week I drove for more hours than I can count to get to Ringhals, Forsmark and Oskarsholm, three very beautiful nuclear power plants in Sweden. Unfortunately, I mistimed my trip. The entire stay in Sweden there was nothing but rain and fog. So to get home with something useful, I traveled to Gothenburg where I interviewed the guys from Cairnfall Energy. Sorry about that. I'm John. I'm Christian. And uh, yeah, we're um, we're in Sweden, and we're we're building a new kind of um, way of. of of addressing and working and enjoying uh, nuclear power. Um, since 2019, I think, we started with the first company of ours, so, so now Carnful Group has a couple of companies in it. And um, the first one, like, like you mentioned, is, is the electricity supplier business, which has been a really cool uh, success for us to really reach out and get, uh, get uh, the, the general public, uh, households, companies, enthusiastic. <laughs> and uh, that's now operational in Sweden and in Denmark, actually, so it has been exported. You started this like four years ago, right? Yeah, so about four years. It feels like a lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, or a couple of <laughs> so, so how did it go? I mean, uh, I guess that from, from the beginning, you have an idea, and you, you're not quite sure how it will go. So, so tell us something about it. Yeah, I mean, we, both John and I, we don't have a nuclear background. Uh, I come from a finance background, and John comes from a fintech background. Um, but we both saw these challenges um, in the 2017, 2018, especially when the IPCC report came out. Uh, that in order to, you know, almost get ahead of the curve in the climate change, we need to roll out an immense amount of, of power. And we couldn't see any other way to do that without including nuclear. Uh, but the nuclear space has been really with, you know, almost legacy problems. Uh, problems that didn't arise from it being a poor product, but it arose from um, not being treated the the way it was supposed to be treated, you know, PR wise, but also in the way that you build and operate them. And so we, we saw that in order to do this and have this immense impact that we could have with nuclear, we needed first to start with the narrative. You know, we can talk about nuclear the yeah. way we used to talk about nuclear. So that's why we set up the first business to consumer brand. Or nuclear, shine food energy, carnival energy. Yeah, that was. Uh, it was basically trying to be Hans Rosling, the famous author of Factfulness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the guy brand, with the brand. spear and the guy with the toys. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, dishwasher, etc. Yeah, no, he was an inspirational guy for us, I guess, in terms of how to like talk about facts in a in a, in a fun but yet uh, you know friendly way. Um, so so we we just um, decided that there's a you know. A good way to offer 100% nuclear energy tariffs. Um, the way that the, um, I mean, you can have 100% wind or solar um, using these guarantees of origin that we have many opinions about as a tool. Well, but it's five year old electricity issues. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, 16 months at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's uh, so we just uh, figured that it would be interesting to see how, how the general public would react to an offer like that, and it was really, it's been really cool to see. It's like so. so you went from zero to how many customers in like a year or two years? A lot more customers than we anticipated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, we have a we have something like Canfall in the Netherlands, yeah. which is a whole body see, and he has well, they they have a, around a thousand customers right now. Yeah. So it's, it's good stuff. It's great. Right. Yeah. No, yeah, we're of course way ahead of that. <laughs> but, uh, but it's also Denmark as well. Denmark's growing so quickly. I mean, the, and Denmark's really interesting as a market because uh, there's the youth are, are getting behind nuclear. In yeah. Sense. In Sweden, I think. I mean, the youth is pro nuclear now as well. But but in Sweden, it's like because we have nuclear power. 
the people who built it back in the, in the days that are still very pro. Um, so that's the, when you look at the demographics of our customer base. It's like there's like a trough. Yeah, yeah, kind of. yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, so and then we're the nineties generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in Sweden, all of our you know not all of them, but a lot of our average customer is like a twenty thousand kilowatt hour um, villa. <laughs> Whereas in Denmark, it's like a student apartment tour, you know, yeah. so as you can tell... It does like 2,000 <clears throat> Exactly, so, but it's, it's uh, no, but it's, it, I mean, we're, we're, it's going very quickly and, and, and in a very nice way, but of course it becomes the bread and butter of Carnival and uh, gives us the chance with a reach into, you know, municipalities and, and, and uh, into the industry as well. Here, here's, here's a very small bridge to that because, uh, well, right now I'm traveling to Sweden. I'm, I make it a point to visit all the nuclear power plants that are here. I, I know that Sweden used to have four, right? Four, yeah. four sites. Four sites. Yeah. Uh, and, and only three of them are active today. Yeah. I, I forgot which the fourth one It's Barsebeck in the south. And that was closed down due to the Danes. Oh, God. Yeah, so, which so, is funny now, right? Because now yeah. Denmark loves nuclear, so... So, so, the, so the, the, the funny thing was, I was, I was at the, at the Ringhans nuclear power yeah. facility yesterday, obviously not on site, because they won't let you in. Oh, it's a beautiful surrounding. But, but indeed, it's in, in a beautiful place, so there's this nature reserve, there's this tip on the south end of this peninsula, yeah. basically. And you can go in there, it's all... You know, you get your feet wet when you walk there. It's not, it's rocks and then it's plants. <laughs> so I was there and I, and I was making pictures of these nuclear power plants and somebody walked up to me and it was a woman with her son. And the woman was in her 50s, I believe, maybe, maybe in the end of the 40s. Now I have to be careful because I'm 40 as well. So it's not that I'm trying to make these people look old. But she had her son with her and her son was like 16-ish. So she walks up to me and she says, excuse me, she, she started talking in Swedish. I said, I'm sorry, but I don't understand Swedish. I'm Dutch. We can, we can talk English if you want. She said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Are you taking pictures of the nuclear power plant? And I said, yes, I'm taking pictures of Wienhaus and its natural surroundings. And she was like, oh, do you do that often? I said, yes, I have uh, taken pictures of at least uh, 50 nuclear power plants by now. And she said, Oh, uh, and I said, I like them, I think they're beautiful. And she says, yes, until, until they go wrong, you know, so you get the, the standard uh, exchange of, uh, I don't like nuclear, this and that and the other thing, and her son interjected and she said, well, I do like them. <laughs> so so there's, there's just the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, I mean, we just had an election and we saw that the, they were, you know, doing polls about everything and, and the build up to it. And I think the only one that I found of interest was, uh, stance on, on nuclear amongst the, the first time voters, which was, I think, was like 80% pro. Right. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, it's due to a lot of things, but I think you know, this new generation of, of voters and, 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 and uh, younger people are, are looking, you know, vastly at what does mega electrification mean in terms of, of you know, <laughs> and how do we actually get there? Uh, and data-driven, you know, uh, generation, so I think they... Um, yeah, exactly, going from something that you have kind of an emotional anxiety about towards something that, you know, has a rational scientific background, and I think we're kind of in the, in the junction between those two now, that right. it's starting to deep over towards the rational scientific approach. Um, which we think is a good thing. You know, uh, then it can be assessed that the merit it has. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you look at I mean, Sweden, is it's it's a big country. How many how many people live here? Ten point five million. Ten point five million. So, so there's and I drove up from Malmo to Copenhagen to uh, to sorry Gothenburg, and and I saw a lot of industry and you know big big buildings which have some kind of economic activity inside them that need a lot of electricity obviously so 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 Sweden is probably going to be a big energy consumer in terms of electricity in the future right? yeah I mean we are already um, when you count per capita uh, energy use we're the second 
in Europe, uh, and we plan to increase that yeah. at least twice-fold in the next 25 years. Yeah. Um, and a lot of our industry is heavy industry, so we will need a lot more energy, not only electricity, but primary energy to solve the problem that we have. Here's one thing I want to ask you, because, because this is uh, something that we encounter in the Netherlands, for instance. So in the Netherlands, we use 850 terawatt hours per year. And this is, this is like a big unit, many people don't really understand what it is. Just, uh, just accept that it's a lot. <laughs> right? It's like if you have uh, uh, an Olympic swimming pool and you need to be able to fill it, you need to be able to fill like 100,000 of them in a year with pumps that consume that, that energy. Um, so when we want to electrify a lot, that means that that in the end you will consume slightly less primary energy, right? Yeah. But it's not going to be a lot. But if you look at the the, the 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 difference between electricity production and primary energy consumption, and you need to raise the electricity bar so high, what what people in the Netherlands they believe that they can import that somehow. And hydrogen or something. What is your idea on that? We don't like the idea of shipping hydrogen. <laughs> we think that hydrogen uh, will have an amazing future, but it should be used um, as a direct input into industries right. converting something. I think. Um, it's produced and consumed locally. Yeah, exactly, locally. Right. Um, we, I think it's problematic to the challenges of uh, shipping the small atom we have. Uh, in some way, and it's not something that we have an infrastructure that we can do today. Right. Uh, so in order to have this, we have to build a whole new infrastructure um, to do that. And I think there's some countries that is on a trajectory where they lock themselves into a hydrogen, a hydrogen economy um, as a whole to replace some of the electricity use as well. Um, and we think that, you know, when we talk about energy efficiency, going from uh, electrons to hydrogen back to electrons, that is kind of the worst case when it comes to energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you should be very mindful that uh, we have huge challenges and we need every single thermal unit that we can yeah. get and use that wisely. Not, not waste. Not yeah. waste. Not waste, uh, not waste anything along the way. Because, because I, I bring this up because of Belgium. Yeah. And uh, it was Belgium, it was even a Dutch MP, uh, who talked to people from Namibia. Namibia. In, in, in one of those COPs. The, the last COP was in Scotland. Right? Yeah. And, and here is this Belgium minister, and she is signing an, basically an MOU. With with a, with with a minister from Namibia, saying Namibia is going to build this much solar panels and hydrogen production capabilities, and is then going to ship that hydrogen to Belgium. And I'm like, do these people even try to figure out how much energy we can ship them? <laughs> you know, the ship alone needs to be able to go that distance. How much how much energy is that going to take? So it's, it's one of those things that people talk about right now, but I, I feel that they don't have a grasp of how big their own challenges are. Yeah, the magnitudes of yeah. But I think, I mean, you're alluding to something interesting. In Sweden, um, the electricity usage is around 140 terawatt hours per year. Um, and That's terms, more than the Netherlands. I believe so. We have 120. Yeah. 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 And, and we're looking at, I think, all the latest scenarios is towards 300. 280, 300 terawatt hours, and I think it will be larger than that if we're going to turn the entire energy cake into to, to fossil freedom. Um, but it's, it's it's I mean that's the challenge. Like you said, mo most people don't understand that even though we decrease the energy pie, the electricity pie is going to be vastly larger. And that was I mean so, to be more than double, yeah. more than triple even in some. Cases. And try to do that. If you, if you look at the Swedish electricity mix, it's um, you know one third, probably more than that, maybe half hydro, and then um, around a third nuclear today, and then we have variable wind power, etc. For for the remaining part, and some biomass. Um, but when you scale that up, hydro you can't scale up anymore, right? right. So 
you're going to need to uh, step up. Yeah. So you're going to you're going to look at ways to fill that role, and and um, of course nuclear power. And I think that's the general consensus of, of, of Sweden now is that nuclear has a big role to play in that in that part of the puzzle. And and that's why I mean, so Cardful Energy was launched as as a business consumer brand, if you like. Yeah. So a bunch of companies using it, but that was our way to get a stand. Um, but then, uh, as of this year, uh, and me and Chris personally. Um, mostly working with Carnival Next these days, which is the first uh, project development company within So that's SMRs. basically, if you, if you look at, you're taking a rocket approach, right? You have stages, multiple yeah. stages. So the first yeah. stage is Carnival. Energy. Is, yeah, yeah. yeah Carnival Energy, trying to engage the public. And change the narrative. And change the narrative. And now you get the second stage, which is yeah, yeah. enabling Right, trying to build yeah, it out yeah. into Roger. Yeah, right. And I mean, we've so had it's, such it's a project development company. That's what you want. Yeah. To exactly right. I think it's the easiest way to understand what we're doing with Carnival Next is to look at how the uh, the wind parks uh, have been built in Sweden predominantly, but elsewhere over the past uh, few decades. Uh, companies that OX2, etc., that have established themselves as a project development company. Yeah. They find a good site. They find a good off taker. They get busy with the permits and the licensing and everything involved and then turn it into a project and that's a good bankable asset and and we're taking that same approach with with Carnival Next but in the world of uh, small modular reactors where yeah. we have we're partners with uh, Jay Tachi uh, for the BWR X300 right right and well it's my, it's my favorite thing Cool. Yeah, it's it's it's, a, mean, it's a beautiful it's, little machine right because yeah. it kind of ticks all the boxes it's it's uh sleek yeah a good size has to build that's that's the whole thing because if you look at the, the nuclear industry, you know, um, currently there is like half a dozen uh, really big units that you could order from some company like Westinghouse or Cap, I don't know, Cap, yeah, Cap, 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 right, right. Um, and then there's <laughs> yeah, and then there's some there's some some if you want a piece of art. <laughs> <Some> <laughs> So, so uh, if you look at the e EPR, for instance, the EPR is not built with economics in mind. It's built to be as safe as possible, right? With two containments and triple redundant pumps and everything. So, so, and if you look at, for instance, the English build at Hinkley Point C, they basically they don't know how much it's going to cost. They just accept that each port, each part of the bill is going to cost X amount of money once that's done, and they get into the next part of the bill, which is you know they basically don't don't know how much it's going to cost. Whereas you see the business development side of this X three hundred the G touchy thing, um, that's an entirely different dog. It can actually hunt, right? No, it's two different mentalities. One, you have design as you go, which is the French version, mm -hmm. that not everything is solved once you start doing and constructing it. And then you have the GE touchways like design to cost, which is, okay, so we have a gap to fill and the part to play in this climate um, change. And in order for us to have a product that fits into this, we need to deliver a product that is competitive, it's delivered on time and at that scale that the customer wants. So it's two completely different mentalities. So here we have a product that actually fits into our current thinking around cost effectiveness. And the other one more has to do with this emotional thing surrounding safety and surrounding how things are supposedly you know, beneficial for not the consumers, but the overall mentality of the yeah. Yeah, I mean, look at BWRX 300. I mean, the passive safety of those things are incredible. I mean, it's ingenious. Which, I mean, it ticks every box in terms yeah. of safety, but it, that's you not. Don't, you, you, don't, you don't need to touch it for seven days. No, and, and after seven days, you have you to have a bucket. And yeah, a and you fill the bucket. Yeah. And no, you no, don't no. even need a fire hose. You can do it with a garden. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> those things are, are really cool, and we're very happy to be able to offer them to the market now in Sweden. And, and uh, you know, it's Sweden's gone through some emotions in terms of its politics um, um, with regards to what we can do with new builds. You mentioned you know four sites. We can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be cool, but, but uh, yeah. But but currently in Sweden, as of today, 
Uh, maybe it's changing today, but but it's um, it's we're only allowed to build ten reactors or have ten active reactors in Sweden at the same time, oh, and right. only at three sites. By law. That's by law, and and that law is now with the incoming government. It's going to be changed so that we're able because, like you said, hydrogen fills a role when it's used directly into yes. industrial processes, which means that we adds need, value. Yeah, but we need you to need be, it to make value. Yeah, but we need to be close to these very heavy industries. Yeah, refineries, steel mills, etc., petrochemicals. We need to be next door providing hydrogen, so we don't need to pipe it too far. You know, these things. and some among us. Yeah, and I think I mean the new government for sure has has really understood these um, opportunities, and, and and that's why Carnival Next is is like very well positioned now to go in and actually deal with the big projects. Now, most of my viewers probably don't know of this, but. Uh, what is the capital of, of what, what is the political capital of, of, of Sweden? Is it Gothenburg or is it Stockholm? No, it's Stockholm. All oh, right. So, yeah. so, so, so you we're on the fringes. You need to you need to travel to back and forth to yeah. talk to these people. I think every once in a while, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think um, politicians have you know started to include nuclear in their discussions and that it's is internalized. Yeah. Right. Uh, which means that they are, you know, adding a lot of knowledge in their circles regarding nuclear. And it makes what we do a little bit easier. We don't have to start from zero with the discussions all the time. Now we're starting at a level that okay, so this is a technology that is here. It's not something that takes fifteen or twenty years to build. You know, we're looking at um, eight years from now, we could have running new nuclear power yeah. plants in Sweden. Um, and that, it requires them to, you know, take action, to do things. Um, so it's really interesting for us to be, you know, at, at this junction now where we're seeing our projects actually gaining a lot of traction and becoming from kind of a pre-feasibility status to a feasibility stages where we are more into how do you construct this, how do you license it. If we start from the beginning, how nuclear used to be built. Yeah. It used to be built and sponsored by states. Uh, and the end customer was the collective. So if you build a nuclear power plant, you, you, uh, you work on an end critical path to have it ready by a certain date because it was going to be connected to the grid. And of course, the grid has redundancies. It would be nice to have another 1600 megawatt or 1200 megawatt on there producing electricity because that would decrease the total electricity price of the market. But there wasn't really um, an effort to get it to 10 years instead of 15 years because you have the redundancy. When we are very much the opposite, we are talking to industries that are so much on a critical path that in 2032, they promised their customers that their product is going to be fossil free. Right. Uh, and Faster and more intense is the message. Yeah. Well, I mean, they promised their shareholders, right, that by this date, we will provide fossil free products for you, uh, which gives them a sense of urgency that we don't have historically. But I mean, there's a lot of things. Yeah, and then you can almost work your way backwards from uh, this critical point. This was need, yeah. clear need. A clear commitment. And on a certain day. And then we have to be able to meet that day. Um, and preferably, that's what, preferably with a little bit of. Yeah. Of course, problem. there's some panic in it as well. <laughs> um, but we, and that means we cannot deliver it the same way we used to deliver. So this is um, more not of a, a state matter, this is a border to border matter now. Mm -hmm. um, which means that. We are looking at different ways of funding reactors than we used to. This is not state sponsored anymore, built by the collective purse, to say. Uh, this is something that the company itself needs to somehow fund through, you know, purchasing power agreements or um, being able to somehow be an off taker, not an owner of a plant. Uh, so we see the old model where you have a state-owned utility or municipality or well, utility. to a degree, yes. Of course, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Owner yeah. and operator. Yeah. 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 They have the whole thing. They develop the project, they will be the owner, and they will operate this for 60 years. And absorb it on their own balance sheets, right? Uh, 
And it is a bit hard to scale that. Those organizations are not built to scale these things. Yeah. Um, it's not in their psyche. No, it's not because they they are kind of companies that are they have a very very long term view on what they do. And very much it's inertially traveling. There's yeah. so much inertia in it, it just rolls. It rolls. Yeah. So you can't find because inertia is what we miss in the Swedish grid right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you I think you need that agile, more entrepreneurial thing to be able to explain to the customer now that is not the collective but it's a company mm -hmm. instead how we can help them you know meet their critical time where they need to be foresight free and do that in a competitive way right and we're all i mean we're talking about this is next gen i mean we're not inventing a new kind of um, cooling method for no. reactors here what we're talking about is innovation within uh, the delivery, in terms of the methodology associated to delivering plants on time, small modular reactors, and finance. Yeah. Those are the two areas which we innovate like crazy within um, at Carnival. So how do you separate owner, operator into a new world where the operator, because they will of course have a big role to play in this new landscape. But might as well be bottom farm. Yeah, of course, that's of what course. we're thinking. I mean, and I think, I mean, the reception we've had as, a, as the first project development company by the likes of Atom Fun, Unipair, Fortum, etc., has been very open armed. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they see this is of interest, and, and we talk a lot with those kind of people about the view of the operator as a service. We call it the oasis in, in terms of <laughs> nice. because they need to find a way where they can get you know bigger returns on investment and that's good to do in a service kind of methodology and they're really good at operating plants right but if you're going to have the ownership of the asset on your own balance sheet you're going to suffer in that sense so, so by, by separating out the financial asset from the operator part where you have the license where you have the back end where you have the commitments of insurance etc from the actual financial asset which can be yeah. You know, and this is the perfect kind of asset for the likes of pension funds, for infrastructural funds, right. or for, for, you know, a lot of different off-takers or, or uh, investors in that segment. So there's a, there's a whole new landscape, and that's what we're very busy kind of innovating within that framework. What does that mean in terms of, you know, reg tech or uh, in terms of, of how we can we can help out? All right. So, so, I mean, so that's why we need companies like ours. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's all right. We're having a, we're having a conversation. Um, yeah. I mean, so to some degree, I guess that you you look at the Netherlands, for instance, with APZ and PayZ, that they have a similar model to us. What you are now proposing yeah. it is EPZ, which is the open, which is the operator of the Boston nuclear power plant, and then you have PayZ, which is the owner. Exactly. Um, so, 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 so uh, the problem is, it's still not a commoditized ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I think that's true. That's yeah. true. If because even if it helps all, and, and, and you know, there's, yes, sir, yeah. there's still that model is here today. Oh, right. But it's right. not commoditized. But, yeah, so I think commoditizing the ownership is going to be key to, to doing this because commoditizing ownership lifts out a how, few how other do you, how do you understand what that means commoditized. yeah so commoditized means that you're actually treating the ownership or your share of ownership as a good right that you can trade ah, okay. yeah. so you're not locked into a 60 or 80 year old commitment of your ownership uh, which means that you don't have to add the risk premium that you're locked in and you have engaged your balance sheet for this amount of time. Right, right. Uh, and for With all the all the market uncertainties that, that surround us today. Yeah, and I think uh, commoditizing something is something uh, is a way of decreasing the overall risk in ownership mm -hmm. uh, because you always have the you know the option to opt out to sell your share. Uh, and if you do that, we can decrease the capital cost immensely in these projects. Right. Um, because otherwise, as it has been, when you take and do an investment decision, that's 60 years commitment. Yeah. It's very, very hard to unload your part of ownership of a nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that that is going to be the key. And also, it releases you know the boundaries of ownership, so you can pull into other type of capital. So, for instance, if you have if you have a, a, a corporation somewhere with a lot of uh, private people who want to say who say, listen, we want to own a little bit of the department. That's possible then. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, and even, you know, so there's other ways I guess that's getting yeah. equity. Exactly. And, exactly. and I mean, in the most, most kind of commoditized way would be to almost list it on a stock exchange yeah. financial asset as is. Yes. Yeah. Um, that might not be an optimal way of doing it because you have kind of a large yeah. equity yeah. element in it. Right? And, and then, then it becomes too fluid. To yeah. Some degree, yeah. Right? The, the uh, and options. you kind of, I think you want an intelligent owner and then someone who yes. who does understand the risk uh, involved in investing in something that has kind of a, a political agenda. Yes, and that they, 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 they understand that uh, they need to be capable of working with you know, the operator, for instance, because there's, there's, there's a tie there. There, there is a relationship between them. And of course, it's, it's that interface yeah. between the owner and the operator that we are currently putting a lot of resources how, how into. How would that work with, for instance, if you need to do an overhaul of the plant? Uh, normally, the owner will pay for that, yeah. right? not the operator. No, but it, it, so. it's not something that uh, prohibits, in this model, prohibits that at right, all. Right, right. Uh, you can use uh, new emission, you know, emittance of shares mm -hmm. in the owner company that funds the overhaul of the company. Right. Um, but, and also, of course, the operator uh, of the plant, they need to, you know, have assurances that capital will be provided in case legislational changes yeah. Uh, arise where they need to do overhauls. Oasis, Oasis contracts are yeah. important, right? Oasis. I love that name. I always check. Just, just have a check. That's why I have two cameras. I can cut. And a lot of these things, you know, they're, they're, this is a new way of thinking. This is what we say financial innovation. Um, but the end game of this would be extreme low capital costs. Right of building nuclear power plants, which we think we will have to get to in order to have this immense rollout. It, does, this, does this model also uh, incentivize um, a more efficient build-up? Definitely, yeah. which is back to the delivery right. innovation. Yeah. Right, because, that, because that's, that's very key, right? If you, if you look at the heat point C or the open water or the farm vehicles, that's just not a business model. Why? No, even if it's always going to be a first of kind. Whenever you build that, even though it's an EPR, it's still going to be a first of kind. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess. I guess. I have this, yeah, I have this discussion all the time with people who say, "Just build the EPR." And then I say, "Which EPR? Do you want to build the Chinese, the Finnish, the French, the EPR two, the UK, the EPR two? Which one?" Uh, according to whose rules, the you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it, it's still not a blueprint that you can simply... No, and I think we need to get there. Yeah. Uh, I think that's very, very clear that... The productizing bit. Yeah. It really needs to be a product. It's yeah. Like order. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's not a construction, it's a product. Yeah. I think you were alluding to that that booklet over there, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean to look back to that. I mean if you if you just go back to when we started, I guess 2019 we started an electricity supplier, but this Carnival Next idea had been there before that as well, and we were hoping that we would get to a stage where we could we could launch that concept. Um, at that stage, I mean public perception was low of nuclear or people didn't care because it existed and we had no issues in Sweden. There was no real need. Exactly, right. In 2018, 19, 20 was the lowest, the cheapest electricity year in Sweden yeah. uh, ever, right? Um, Pretty much anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of makes sense. It was all 40 euros per yeah. megawatt hour. Exactly. But, but if you would want to build something that was like 55 or 60 euros per megawatt hour, you, would, you were out of your mind. Exactly, right. That's yeah. sense. No, so we had that, and then of course the uh, EU taxonomy hadn't been approved yet, um, and we in Sweden we didn't have a decision on the final waste repository. Um, so those were like mountains to climb for a company 
like ours and everyone involved in this industry. And, and, and now we're like, we're in 2022 now, and we've ticked those boxes, and we also have an incoming pro-nuclear government, um, where it's already in place now, yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's another tick in the box, um, which kind of, and of course the geopolitics of everything has kind of fast-tracked everything. everything. Everything is shifting yeah. into high. Yeah, I guess that's put things on a hyper speed, but, but nonetheless, this would be the outcome Regardless, like, if, you know. if, if, if for instance the whole European gas crisis wouldn't have been there, I, 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 my guess would, would be that we would still be in this situation today. Well, I don't know, pan European, no, but in I Sweden we wouldn't. I mean, Sweden, it was, it was evident that we were losing because when we stopped having, I think they closed down two reactors, we, we also two, the, yeah. we instantly saw that the, the transmission capacity from north to south for the hydro disappeared. And we were exposed by by European prices. And Swedes are like we use twice as much electricity per capita. Yeah, and, so true. And 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 in Norway, we should even mention they use yeah. four times as much, and they're exposed but, to. But it's, it's so, logical because you have heat yeah. pumps and such. Right? So yeah. this this whole this whole situation we're talking about would have existed in Sweden at least, um, regardless. Um, but now, of course, it's been on, on high for So how, how's the gas situation in Sweden? Do you use any gas? For no, no. We only use gas for industrial processes. Right. Yeah. right. So it's, it's not a commodity that gets shipped to homeowners because no. in the Netherlands it's like 90% of, of course, yeah. um, all the homes can heat by gas. Yeah. I mean, we, we did in the 60s and 70s, uh, especially in the early 70s with the oil crisis, we had kind of a national plan to get you know really self-sufficient and get rid of the fossil that was a smart move that was a smart move uh, and that, that means that we our bet was to electrify everything very smart yeah um, which means we have a lot of direct electricity yeah I mean, <laughs> exactly now that are suffering due to the prices but and now so, we have heat pumps to a large extent as so well. and earlier earlier during, during this conversation, you mentioned that you can only have four sites and ten reactors. reactors. Yeah, so that's three the, sites. And three ten. sites and ten reactors. So right now, what you're looking at is you want to open up this market. And that's exactly what I was going to do. So we right. came we came above you know across these mountains <laughs> now, right? Yeah, but I think it's an interesting part of it. And and we you know the final waste repository taxonomy yada yada. We're at a stage now where we have an environmental law that needs to be changed, the paragraph in there. Yeah. And there also needs to be a mandate to the uh, regulatory body, still say kids maybe have them, to look at ways of dealing with SMRs, for example. Right. Yeah. And both of those things are around in this new government. This handbook here that was written, or the guidebook that was written over, over the, the summer, we and were, we were says, Start program for new nuclear power. Yeah, exactly. Spence nicely. I mean, it's a very important organization, and we've been very happy to to, to contribute with with intelligence into it. But but it's 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 it, it was it was written regardless of the outcome of the election right. for the incoming government yeah. to know what to do. There's a timeline in there, and and now I mean, we already know that in this new government, the, the, that law of four sites, ten reactors will be changed. Um, we also know that the the stores against maybe at the regulatory body will be, you know, progressive and, and working openly to do uh, SMRs. Um, so it's like the landscape has crystallized out um, in, a, in a nice way for us to actually get uh, get going. Um, and and uh, you know, of course, we could have built on you know, there's six active reactors in Sweden currently. Yeah. So there's four open slots, if you like. But those are at those sites, and, and uh, you know, you would need you would need to tear down a reactor first before you can build them up. No, you you probably can build all, ring holes. For no, you probably can build there. You yeah. can build a couple more there uh, without tearing them down. But uh, building four new reactors doesn't That's solve the problem. Mm -hmm. No, no. Well, Especially well, if you build four, three hundred megawatts. No, we need twenty-five <laughs> more gigs. Yeah, uh, I mean, we don't need yeah. four gigs. It doesn't solve anything. So right now you're the tip of the spear, basically. Yeah, definitely, and and then we're expecting, of course. Some people will follow in your footsteps. Of course, yeah, and I hope so. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we see it around in other countries. Um, some project development companies coming around, and, and I'm sure we will. I mean, it's and, but I think um, you know. I think we have a, a, a head start, um, yeah. and we have you know the intelligence, the the, the people that we need around us, and, and also the the tech. Was, I mean, Sweden is a is a high, highly highly developed country. 
with smart people, good education, and so in the end, you will find the, the, the person that you need. Yeah, and I mean, we, this BWRX is uh, a lot of it is Swedish tech. You know, so, and you only need so. 70 people to run it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of staffing, that's for the Oasis part of the conversation. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But it's, it, you're right. No, but I think what Chris is alluding to, and that one of the reasons that we wanted to, to sign up to BWRX 300 is that Sweden, as a country is extremely knowledgeable about boiling water reactors. Boiling water reactors. I mean, yeah. you, you've got like six, I see, uh, six running right now. Yeah. Right now. yeah. Six. Uh, two PBRs. Yeah. Two PBRs and four. And four boiling water yeah. reactors. But I mean, all of the subcontractors. But it's all GE Dutch. No. 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 But the, the, well, GE, there is a lot of GE stuff in there. It, there is a lot of GE stuff in there. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. So, so they, they, they already. No, but the boiling water uh, reactor technology, I mean, it's kind of sprung from the same tree yeah. in the beginning, yeah. and then there's just offshoots in different the reactor is, designs. If you look at the, if you look at the reactor design of BWRX 300, the chimney is the exact chain, same chimney that was used in the, in the Dodoa reactor in the Netherlands. Yeah. The exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. And the reason, and the reason is simple. They say, well, this is this is how big it needs to be to get natural convection going. Plus, it is already designed, it or it is already licensed. So why not just? I mean, it? those things are important, right? Because you look at um, the the Swedish Stolzegger we have, and they 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 will get something new on their table now. So the more we can increase. Wait a second. Um, what is this? All of this. Yeah, that's cool. Who's calling? No. So, 43 minutes, let's see how the battery goes. Oh, it still has two starts. We can reach an hour. Sorry to, uh, for that interruption. Let's no, start. We, we were talking about the chimney and, and how that already is licensed technology. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what we want to do is lower the barriers as much as possible in every aspect here, because this is a new world anyway so yeah. if we can if we can use technology that our authorities are, are you know used to then that helps a lot i mean we brought in some of the key regulatory expertise into our uh, company and, and and looking and comparing at the, the the existing framework with what needs to happen you know it's crucial that we can do that with technology that is not you know Sodium cooled, right? Now. <laughs> yeah. Pebble, pebble bed, high yeah. temperature. I love all those things, yeah. right? Oh, but, sure. I mean, but it will come along when it comes along. We're a project we, development company. Yes. We, we're, 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 I mean, if you need, you need we to, sell what exists. Right, and you, you, need, you need to be able to work with the regulator to get it done. Yeah. And, if, and you, can't wait, you can't wait for the next thing. No. Always. No. At one point, you have to start building. Yes. And that start building will enable future technology that will come with different type of applications, you know, exactly. higher temperatures or uh, mini reactors that fit that's, into local But that's grades, something that will come. That's, yeah, that, well, that's something years that will come away. 10 years after your first. And back to your analogy of the, the Carnival rocket, right? Carnival energy, Carnival next. You know, there's probably going to be more pieces of that sure. rocket. Um, Carnful hydrogen, mm. Mm. Uh, just, just yeah. or carnful, I don't know, in the uh, car, car, carnful uh, industrial. Uh, we can't tell you, but there's a big plan. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it has all been drawn up, but it's a oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all been drawn up. There's at least two so. more companies in the, in the pipe. Right, right. But, uh, so, so, but from, from the regulator thing, just, just to bring it back to my own country, the Netherlands, we have the ARN gas, which is the, the, the Dutch nuclear uh, and the Dutch Nuclear Safety Authority, basically, they are they have the sole uh, the sole right to to uh, issue licenses, construction licenses, licenses, and uh, operation licenses. When we introduced them to GE Touch to talk about the BWRS three hundred as the Elysee Foundation, because what we did was we, 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 we simply said that we need to get the ball rolling, we need to stick our foot between the door and just get, get get people talking, right? So we literally said, Okay, we have a development company, we have a technology, we're just going to march them into the door at the nuclear regulator at the nuclear nuclear regulator. And they were happy as a clam because they were like, yes, 
oil and water reactor. We know that technology. We can, we can do it, no problem. And they are enthusiastic about it. <laughs> but I guess most of these places have been like focusing on decommissioning for the past yeah. 10, 20 years. So they're really happy to see. I mean, it wasn't when we well, launched it. Well, ours has been trying to uh, license uh, a test reactor okay. for, for, for the production of uh, medical isotopes. But it has taken eight years to get that done because of the you know the environmental impact assessment to get that done you need to get a permit to stick your to stick a shovel in the ground and test the acidity and test the underground and each thing requires a permit and it takes a and million I, years I think you're you're saying something extremely important there that um, in almost all aspects uh, and in all countries We've had this bull market in regulations yeah. over the, the last but 20 40 years. Not. Yeah, which means that we kind of over regulated something that makes it almost impossible to solve problems. Right. And I don't think that was the intention when we did this first. Yeah. I think the intention was that you should be mindful when you do things, they, you take all, you know, a holistic view on things. It should not be counterproductive. No. Uh, and I see now, uh, I see maybe in the next five years, I think we will see a lot of countries taking a step back and saying, okay, so let's focus on the problem. And the problem is solving the climate change issue. Right. It's not so much about, you know, making sure you have seat belts and you have suspenders and you have all these on in every little single instance. Four and the stakeholders- 10 pounds. Yeah, and not only that, but all the stakeholders that are right. involved in it, um, the environment, uh, the population around you, all of these, you know, needs to be aimed at the same goal, solving, you know, this transition from fossil yeah, to fossil. Making it possible rather than, rather than frustrating. Yes. Because yeah. that's, that's one of the things. We wrote a transition plan as the Easy Foundation. And, and we put a time, we put a, a, a timetable in there for, we basically timed each unit out. We, we made a, a, a development path for each individual unit. And we came, we, we put 35 gigawatts of nuclear generating capacity in there. And then a guy from NRG who is involved with Paulus walked up to me and he said, you are very optimistic. And I said, well, I may be optimistic, but this, this needs to happen. This must happen. If you want to build this much capacity, you have to smooth things out and make sure that it runs efficient. So he, 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 he agreed with me. So we are now in contact and looking at what went wrong with Paulus. Why did it take eight years? Obviously, it was something that they were designing from scratch. So obviously, that will take time. But all the environmental impact assessment stuff, that's and I don't, and, and to be honest, I don't think it's a nuclear specific issue. No, no. It, it has to do with everything. Yes, the environmental impact assessment we, does. We, yes. we look at battery we factories or too much parks or, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's everyone's. If they find a hamster on the terrain sure. where, you, where, where you want to build, yeah. then it's. We had that here with the big battery factory. They found a frog. Yeah, right. right. In, in our day, neck of the woods is a hamster. We have a real wild hamster. Uh, <laughs> but it, all of these, I mean, it, I think what we will see in the coming, uh, you know, decade here is 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 a completely new mindset in terms of solving right. problems. But solving them rationally, and I think I think what is good now is that at least in Sweden, and I think pretty much elsewhere, there's a tech neutrality stance to it. I mean, okay. We need we need to look at the energy sovereignty, <laughs> the, the, the emissions. Yeah. What are the tech available? Okay. And, you see it by the way, tech sovereignty. It's good that you bring it up. You see it. It's now. Yeah, it, it, it has become number one. Security of supply. Yeah. It, it was like number ten. Yeah. No, 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 list four no. years ago. No, and I think uh, you know again the industry was a little bit ahead of. When I say industry, I don't mean nuclear industry, but industry as a whole. They were a bit ahead of this when they started maybe almost 15 years ago, but more so in the last five years, starting to un onshore a lot of their production yeah. uh, to make sure that... Reversing the China, reversing the China process. Yeah, I mean, that, and not only China, but they, that globalization, 
has a price as well. Yeah. It's you see the trade as a very, very good way of you know lowering the marginal cost of a unit. But the problem is that if you're not you can't deliver, then it doesn't matter what the marginal cost of the unit is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the security of supply is starting to work its way with this, and of course it will be a big, big thing when it comes to building up new energy. Will you offshore it, or will you onshore it? Uh, and a lot of discussions right now on the EU level is how do we uh, depend more on it's each more, other? Yeah, it's more onshore now. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's everywhere. They, they, they even say it out loud now, we want to reduce our dependence on China. And it, well, to some degree it's impossible, because some of the things that they have, that they have bought are enshrined in stuff like IP. You know, for instance, new Indian magnets. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't make them anywhere else outside, you know, outside China, because they own the IP to, to the process to make those. So, so there's a problem there. You can buy a new D in Europe, sure, but you can't make permanent magnets out of them unless you dare to cross China and say, listen, to hell with the IP. And so to some degree, it's impossible to do it unless you're willing to kick the bank. <laughs> no, but I think when you start, uh, when we, go, I mean, we have had in Sweden, we've had a bit of this kind of renewable transition in, um, Germany that tried a lot to do the renewable Six hundred billion in. Yeah. Um, but things haven't really started to change yet. No. So it's what we do from this day and the next 15 years that's going to matter. Yes. yes. We're, at the, we're, we're at a pivot moment right now. Everything is going to pivot. And it will take some time to, to pivot. But I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic in the fact that can fall. Saw it coming to some degree. I mean, we've been working uh, as a project company for 24 months really doing this. So even though we we went public with the company in March, this uh, year, yeah. yeah, this year it's been in the works for a long time. So we have you know quite a good idea on how to do this. And yeah. the customers has quite a good idea on the path that we will join them on. Um, so it's in the works. Yeah, how the transition is happening as we speak now. Right. Right. Is there anything you would like to, is there an end note <laughs> put in there? Uh, I think the SMR is a game changer in so many more ways than only it being uh, a faster build out, a cheaper build out, cheaper build out a more certain outcome when you build something. But this is something that can let municipalities or provinces or districts gain a competitive edge that they have. Yeah. They will create a lot of opportunities in attracting customers uh, or companies in the future that will build prosperity for yes. these provinces in the future. And I think that's something that hasn't really entered the discussion too much, you know, that you're creating GDP. Yeah, I mean, we have the Karlskog is one of those municipalities that I've been hoping about, the, the, they're thinking about this. I mean, it's really all about new jobs, about attracting new investments. They don't need, you know, 300 megawatts themselves, but they see it as an opportunity. It's the same with, you know, the 90% capacity factor. That's an opportunity. In, in, in a future where we're fossil free with itself, everything, yeah. yeah. In itself, it, it's, it's not worth that much. But the fact that you can generate worth, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean, you can all leverage their energy. Yeah, they're perfectly positioned for you know uh, jet A or hydrogen into industrial processes or you know heating. I mean, it's just like this is the opportunity you're given as a, as a smaller municipality going after this when you have a district heating. Uh, right you know, plant that's going to close down, you know, replace it with an SMR, you'll have electrons and heat. Yeah, you, you, you've you just ahead. upgraded your, 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 your district heating yeah. system by a factor of a million. Yeah, no, but kind of, no, no, well, not, not, just, not, not just in terms of 
size, but in terms of what it can put out. It's almost like, I, I kind of laugh sometimes when when I go back to like the simulator games I played on PC in the late uh, mid 90s, like SimCity. Sim if you wanted to have a prosperous city in SimCity, the what industry. the power plant yes. was the key to oh, that. Yes, yes, and and it's, it's, because you needed industry. Yeah, and it still is. If you can have local energy, you can do anything. Yeah, and that's also. I mean, we're in Gothenburg, right? This is the industrial hub of Sweden, so we can have the government stop them. We can go there. We can talk to them, but around here is where you have it's here, right? Yeah. But it's it's the western what's western edge that has the best access to the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, we have the third largest port in Europe here. We have. Like, you know, one of the largest car manufacturers. Yeah, uh, we have. I mean, it's sure there's some some economic activity going on in the Baltics, but the access to the access to Norway, UK, Netherlands, it's all, all the rest. Right that sort of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but in Sweden, I mean, we we're talking a lot about the northern parts of Sweden and 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 all of the incredible stuff happening up there. But I mean, it's it's, nice. not, it's wonderful. But it's it's uh, it's happening everywhere, and I think uh, you know I think we're very very well positioned both geographically, but also in the market. And I think it's it's exciting times up there for Carnival. Is it Carnival or Carnival? It's Carnival. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna skip the. <laughs>